what Jean said is kind of the crucial stuff. What we're going to say, we're, we're going to try to uh, tell you guys is some of the observational things and the sort of voice of experience in a lot of ways. And a little bit of the folklore kind of bullshit stuff too. But that's, you know, that's this club. Um, Urban legend. The, the first thing here is an image to scare everyone. It was from Harper's Weekly, the cover of Har Harper's Weekly in 1875 of our cove looking about from somewhere on Black Point and when there were two, when there were swim clubs down here and I think it was the first drowning down here and it has the little path of the person who did it. <laughs> and it was a guy who was president of the Bank of California and nobody knows exactly why he drowned. The bank went under on that day. He went for his swim in the bay and he drowned. So it is dangerous out there and it's been happening for a long time. He was a regular swimmer. There were swim clubs there down at that end of the cove. Well, this club was at that end of the cove at that time. Anyway, that's where it was. That happens. The cove is, is a wonderful place to swim and is much safer, but every place out there has its, is, you can be vulnerable. So you have to be careful in spots. Yes. Um, next, next picture shows more historical image of what that cove looked like. Other problems at that point, a lot of pollution at that point. You know, people talk, the old timers down here when I joined would talk about pushing toilet paper out of the way. So be very thankful of the water that you do swim with. Be very grateful. Okay, next picture. Um, that one of those is our club, a uh, close up I think at one time when it was down at the foot of Van Ness. Next picture, railroad tracks going over where that tunnel is. And so we didn't have to worry about, next picture, trains that could possibly go through here. That was a worry maybe at that time. You don't have to worry about those anymore. And next image, our cove. Great. Okay. Well, I'm starting. I think right? you get to start. I get to start. Okay. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're just, we have sort of a list of um, things for you to think about uh, before you're swimming, while you're swimming. Um, and then one of the things that, uh, that you want to remember, I was looking up random definitions. I remember back in the 70s when I took my first life-saving class, the definition of panic is a sudden onset of fear or anxiety that reduces a person's capacity for self-help. And the most important part is the end of it. So what we want to do is we want to give you information so that you can be thinking. And if you're thinking calmly and clearly and something starts to go other than the way you wish it would, then maybe you'll be less likely to panic and then more likely to be able then to think clearly through to get yourself back out of the water. So for um, before the swim, um, one of the things you want to do, and anybody who sees me in the locker room in the morning knows I'm a maniac about this, you want to know for yourself what the wind forecast is, what the weather forecast is, and what the currents and the tides are, are forecasted to be. Right, all forecasts. So this is what somebody decided based on data that it's going to be like, which isn't necessarily what it is like, but it's their prediction of what it's going to be like. And there's two ways to look at the tide. I don't think we want to review the tide book right now, but we can sit down and do it later or on another day. How to do the table tide book and the, um, and the graphic tide book. Different people's minds work differently, so they might like one um, better than the other. The most important thing, though, is to See what those predictions are, and then based on what the predictions are, you go out and you plan your swim, you plan your swim, and then you have your swim, and then you come back and you evaluate at some point in addition to the wasn't it great, wasn't it fun, did it turn out the way that I thought it was going to turn out based on what I thought the, current, the um, conditions were going to be before I started? And this is worth 90 seconds of your thoughts every day after your swim. And you'll build a library of, I can get to Fort Mason against a 2.2 flood, but I can't get there against a 2.4 flood, as an example. Those are the kind of things that you'll start to build in your mind. I know, I, I know what I feel comfortable with. I know that I should start thinking that this definitely won't work for me, or it might work for me, that kind of thing. And if you know, we talk about Gary Emick as the Alcatraz master. You know, I don't know if you've heard of Gary referred to as the Traz master. He keeps a written log of all 1,100 or whatever, some ridiculous number of Alcatraz swims that he does. 
he, and the ones that he's race directed. He keeps a log of what the conditions were and then how it went. And since then, he's also been keeping GPS traces of his swims. And I think you'll find that everybody who does long training swims does a similar thing. I thought this was going to happen, and this is what did happen. So start, start your awareness of that. Um, the other thing is, is that you definitely want to know for yourself what it's going to be like. Don't take other people's word for it. I think I'm faster than this person, so I can go with them because they say they're going to swim in this set of current conditions. You need to know for yourself whether, it's, whether or not it's going to work. Um, and then to kind of build a little bit on what Jeannie was talking about, about that cold water diuresis, which I just love that word. Um, you need to make sure that you're well hydrated, which is something that starts the day before. So if you go out late at night and you have a great time and you eat a lot of Chinese food or whatever and you drink a lot, then you're not going to be as well hydrated in the morning as if you um, had had more water to drink maybe and less beer. So, th so think about that. Drink a lot of water and then see how that works for you. And if you're cold, if you, if you think you're unreasonably cold one time, the next time try drinking a little bit more water before you get in. Don't be thirsty when you get in because there ain't nothing out there that's going to help you with that. You need to get that taken care of beforehand. I, I personally, I drink water before I go to bed and I drink at least a quart of water between when I get up and when I get in the water. I have a bottle in my bag, I have a bottle in my car that's always full, and I'm just sipping away. It's not like this big glug thing, but I sip away at it the entire time that I'm awake between when I get up and when we leave the locker room to go to the beach. So just bear that in mind. You can't, I mean, you can be overhydrated, but not if you're just sipping away at it over the time that you're awake. So you're, you're on that. Um, there's, uh, one of the things when um, Vanessa said our swims and had the distances on them, the distances are amazingly deceiving. I mean, that is how far it is if you were walking it or if you're in a boat. And I'm not even sure if it's nautical miles versus other miles. But you have to understand that a distance is, it's really, there's time and distance. It's not just distance. You know, if you swim out to, you know, what the Dolphin Club calls this area, which is the big repair, that's a different, it could be a very different time if you do it on a flood or if you do it on an ebb. So don't get wedded to say, saying, I'm going to swim to Fort Mason or I'm going to swim a flag. I'm going to swim to the opening and back because what you're really swimming is an amount of time. And so I learned after the first, the first 23 years that I was a member here, I didn't wear a watch and I never swam in the winter time. But in the winter time, I realized I need to figure out how much time I'm in the water. It's very deceiving. You think you're comfortable in cold water and in the winter time, you're not necessarily. And so you swim for time. Like if you think if you're going to swim for 40 minutes, you swim for 40 minutes. If you swim um, a, two coves, that might be something different than what you think that time is. Like two coves could be an hour, two coves could be 45 minutes, two coves could be an hour and a half, two coves could be forever. And so you've got to make sure you know the time. I think Einstein said something about that with time. Um, the other thing is uh, with caps. Uh, when you Take your cap off, make sure your hair is dry. If your hair is not dry, then you probably have a cap that leaks and it's not doing you the kind of work that it probably should be doing. Okay. All right. Um, earplugs. Definitely wear earplugs. If you saw when Jeannie had that great graphic of your core and your shell and the two different temperatures, the core temperature went up into your head, right? The, the orange, because that's where your brain is. If you're not wearing earplugs, then the cold water goes in your ear, and now it's closer to your brain than it would be if it were just outside your perfectly working swim cap that keeps your hair dry. So if you don't wear earplugs, you get that cold water inside your head, and then that is going to make you get colder faster. Additionally, there are uh, joyous things like you can get vertigo. If you have water rolling around in your ears, it upsets your vestibular system. It can make you nauseous, disoriented. Um, and, and you can also then have a hard time getting back to the beach if you're disoriented. You don't really know which way is forward. Um, and that can happen. You can be nauseous. And being nauseous is really, and I should know, but being nauseous is, is really miserable um, if you 
because if you have to get back to land for it to go away. So uh, there's also uh, surfer's ear, which is a, um, a thing where the cartilage inside your ear canal grows and your ear canal gets smaller in your body's overwhelming attempt to keep your brain warm at all times. And eventually, and it's called surfer's ear because I think it was much more common, surfers not wearing earplugs and so forth. They eventually will have to rotor rooter out your ear canal, which is unpleasant, and I understand from somebody not covered by insurance. Um, so you definitely want to take earplugs both for the immediate and the long-term effect of swimming in cold water. Also less likely to have, um, depending on how everything, your, everything is set up, you can be less likely to have ear infections or sinus infections, that kind of thing. There's endless kinds of earplugs out there. And it's totally a personal choice of which ones you like, um, which ones work for you. They're not that expensive. If you don't currently wear them, buy a bunch of different kinds or a couple different kinds. Ask your friends. Maybe people have pairs that they haven't tried yet that you can try out. I don't recommend sharing them among people. But um, definitely find something that, that works for you and then use them all the time. It's, it's really important in the long run for the long run health of your swimming. Uh, okay, now this may this is probably more folklore, but it seems to work for me, and it's something I learned from when I first joined from a wonderful swimmer um, and surfer, Billy Wilson, and he would always say he saw me and he thought there's another skinny guy who's going to be in trouble, and he would look at me, take me aside, and said, "Put something on your feet, put something on your feet," and I think it helps. I think you know walking down to that water as warm as you can stay all the way to the water, especially on a cold day, you're going you're gonna to do better. I'm not sure you lose any heat out of your bottom of your feet, but it sure does seem to help. So I would encourage you to have something on your feet when you're swimming. Not when you're swimming, when you're going down there. Yeah. <laughs> when you're, when you're walking, walking down. down. Yeah, flip-flops. Okay, um, and then on to, uh, so now you've gotten to the beach with your flip-flops and your earplugs and, um, uh, Deciding how you feel, you want to decide how you feel about swimming alone. I know that we say that you shouldn't swim alone, but the more you swim, sooner or later what's going to happen is you have a terrible day at work and you decide, well, you know, the only thing that really sets me right is to go get in and you get down here at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and there's nobody here. Or you make plans with friends and friend or friends to come down here and swim at the same time and then they call, they have a flat tire, blah, 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 whatever, they're not coming, and now here you are. So you can be in a couple of situations. You're either alone, alone, and then you're gonna decide whether or not you wanna swim alone. Or you could be standing on the beach, and there are other people getting in at the same time. Now, are you just standing on the beach at the same time as those people, or are you gonna swim with them? If you're gonna swim with them, do you know them? Do you know their abilities? Are you going to get suckered if their abilities are, if they're more experienced, if they're in a position to swim a, a, into a stronger current than you are? Are you going to end up in a situation where you're someplace and you can't swim against the current because you've thrown yourself in with people that you don't know? So, and this is a decision you have to make for yourself. My recommendation is, is that you know what your plan is and then you stick with your plan. And then if you decide you're gonna get in with people, either people you know or people you don't know, is one person your buddy? So Jeff and I, we swim together. We're like this the whole time. We're like buddies. We get in together, we get out together, we go from point to point around the cove or wherever together. If you get in with a group, are you just like getting in at the same time with them? Is there one person who's, who's keeping an eye on you and you're keeping an eye on them? Your responsibility is 100% for yourself, and your decision making is for yourself. But are you letting the crowd keep an eye on you, and are you keeping an eye on the crowd? But this is something that you need to decide what your approach is to this generally and then every day. Because you might end up in a situation where somebody goes off and doesn't tell anybody, and now you're looking for them, which can create a situation for you. In addition, maybe there's a situation for them. So just think about what it is that you want to do, what your intention is before you get started. Cause just, and also be aware of people who are standing on the beach the same time you are with your crowd, and you know what you're doing. You also want to be aware whether or not they think they're doing the same thing. I know I do that. I'll tell people, 
if somebody comes up and they're standing with us, I'll be the one to say, because I don't mind being the nasty person, I'll be the one to say, okay, so we are going X and we are not stopping. So if you are not in a position to get to X at the same time that we are, we're not waiting for you because we've already set our plan and our plan is our plan, particularly when it's cold. So just something, just something to bear in mind. Okay, so. Um, what, equipments and caps? Yeah, lights and goggles. Where, where a cap people can see, you've probably all have been out there and seen people who have either a wetsuit cap, a black cap, and they're doing breaststroke and you can't see them and you think it's an animal. Well, where something that really is noticeable? Where something, those lime, the rowers, you know, ask rowers what they can see, what, what color they see better. You know, the yellow's good, the orange is good, the, um, the green ones seem to be really good, and different lighting has different color, seems to be better with different caps as well. But please, wear something that is really noticeable. Noticeable. Try not to wear a white cap. Don't wear something that is, I mean, white caps are white caps, not things on tops of people's heads. And wear something that is going to be seen. With goggles, when I first started swimming down here, rarely did anybody wear goggles. You just, you really don't need them in the, in the bay. You can see okay without goggles, but they can be very protective. There is debris out there. If anybody swum in the last few days, there's crap floating around there, and you can you can keep from getting hit in the eye with something. Um, and you do see better with goggles. I mean, you just, you don't have to blink and, and, you know, wrestle with it. However, if you are out there, and I suggest everybody do this, if your goggles break or if you decide don't have your goggles, do test it out at some point and try to swim without goggles and realize how you really can do it in case you are in an emergency situation where your goggles do go belly up and you can't see anything or they've, you know, they just break. Well, you can, don't panic because you can swim fine out there without goggles and people didn't use them 35 years ago. Uh, we also have oh, blinkies. Oh, lights and goggles. I'll let you, oh, I, okay. I don't swim in the dark okay. for often. So oh, I, swim, the, I swim in the dark all the time. Yeah. Okay. So goggles are, uh, your goggles need to be appropriate for the time of day. And I know it's a joke because I have like five pairs and people always comment. I have goggles for every occasion. But People who wear those black aquaspheres and get in at 5.30 in the morning, you can't see anything. But similarly, if you wear clear goggles and you're coming back into the cove in the morning and you're swimming straight into the sun with nothing to protect for the glare, which then gets into your ability to see, and we do have a look where you're going paragraph, so we'll talk about that then. But you will need to have a couple of different pairs of goggles for the appropriate to for your ability to see at a certain time of day and the height of the sun off the water is significant um, in terms of your ability to see and and if you're looking straight at the sun you can't see the other thing to remember there is that if you're swimming away from the sun remember that everybody who's coming towards you can't see you what it, no, it's a real thing. Okay. Yeah, it truly be, is your responsibility. Right. Try to remember. You think, wow, it's crystal clear. That yeah. light is fabulous. Realize in that situation, you're the one who has to look out for other people. Yeah. You know, it takes two people to run into each other, but some people can be more responsible or have to be responsible who are the ones who have the better visibility for sure. And then to talk about lights, I know that the Google group has gone to the term blinky, all right? Every single one of those lights has the ability to t be turned to a solid on. If you have one of those round ones that used to come from Road ID and now you have to get them from Adventure Lights, unscrew the top, take the batteries out, turn them over so the light is solidly on. If your light is blinking, it's only visible half the time. And then you take the swell or waves or whatever or your arm past it and then that further reduces the amount of time that that light is visible. So all lights should be solid. Color is an interesting argument, discussion, I should say. Less, less of a concern what color it is, although white is probably least preferred because the colors can be seen for a longer distance. The other thing to bear in mind about the lights is that if you have a little one inch diameter light on the back of your head, then nobody can see it from the front, all right? So a light on the back of your head doesn't prevent you from a head-on kind of collision. I know a lot of people are wearing like Apple watches and they have sort they sort of glow behind your wrist. 
Um, sometimes I wear a light on my, uh, one of those red lights on my wrist, and I've gone to wearing a light up dog collar. I have it doubled up and stu stuck under my glasses. And I've been told that it kind of glows around my head so you can see me from the front. I've only started doing that like about a month ago. Um, all right, where are we? Okay, so go, moving on from that, um, general awareness about what's going on in the cove. So you're walking out in your flip-flops with your cap and your appropriate goggles and your light. How many shoes are on the dock? Are there no shoes on the dock? Because you've decided that today you're going to swim alone because you have to go to a meeting. There's no shoes on the dock. That possibly means that you're the only person out in the cove. So just that's something to think about, to consider when you're making your the last minute final touches to your plan before you get in the water. Does that then mean that you just want to stay between the buoys and the beach? No shame in swimming the buoy line when that seems like the right thing to do. There's a lot of shoes out there. Then you need to be more concerned about how much you're going to have to look where you're going because you cannot count on the other person to look where they're going, right, to minimize collision. Are there a bunch of people getting ready to row? Are all the stretchers out? The shell crowd is going out. There's rowboat dollies at the end of the dock. Then you need to be aware that the rowers in the cove tend to leave the dock and go straight out the opening, but sometimes they go inside the breakwater depending on the current. Ask them where they're going rowing. Say hello. Introduce yourself. Find out where they're going. If you're going to go to Gas House and they're going to the Golden Gate Bridge, then you're all going to be in the same place. And if you're far away from the pier, you're going to be swimming where they're rowing. And if you've looked at rowers, they're facing the other way. Now, they're responsible for seeing where they're going, but you're more responsible for what goes on outside the cove. The rowers are, are responsible for not hitting you inside the cove, but you can help them by looking for them, being aware, and trying to stay out of their way. Outside the cove, if you're way off of some fixed object and you're hit by a rower, it is entirely your fault. And I'm not saying that because I also swim because my husband's a boathouse captain. It is actually true. If you're out there, you're responsible for yourself outside, totally outside the cove in, in regards to that. So just bear that in mind as well. Um, and again, it's just an input it's just an input into your decision about your plan for the day. But it is also good to get to know the rowers for that Alcatraz, and then somebody, you can get somebody to help you with piloting the first time. Okay. You know, all this stuff is necessary all year round, but it magnifies in the winter time because your time is just shorter. So, you know, you do need to just pay that much more attention. Not that you shouldn't in when it's 65 degrees, but it's just that much more important when it, when it gets colder. Um, one thing that's probably important all year round too, but particularly in the winter time, is starting off slowly if you can. Like you don't want to start out just flailing, thinking I'm cold and I want to generate some heat. You do want to go slow, slow, and some of the swim coaches will certainly tell you that too. Where you don't want to do a have a crap stroke, which is going to get you're going to get hurt at the beginning of a cold water swim. So just be really careful with those kinds of things. You know, there's a, um, a guy here named Frank Coglin, who Coglin Beach is named after, who washed up there on a swim. And he, and he was one of the first people to swim New Year's Day Alcatraz. And he, you know, he said, count to 100. You know, s just slowly, zenfully get into that water and count 100 strokes, and you'll find yourself warm. And I'm sure you've done that already. But be prepared for that to be cold to begin with, and don't, fla don't flail at the beginning of things. Um, oh. You get to the next okay. part of being the okay. claw. The claw, yeah, all right. So um, you want to be you want to be checking in with yourself the whole time. You know, Jeannie talked about this a bit. Typically, again, that graphic with the body temperature, the first place that you're most likely to feel cold is your hands and your feet, and you get you kind of get the claw. Everybody's experienced the claw. You can't turn your light off. You can't necessarily get your goggles off. One time I was trying to pull my cap down and my hand was actually facing the other way. So, and there's just no way, your fingers don't work. That's the beginning. So it's just a matter of time. And what you need to do for yourself is to figure out how long that time is. So if you're starting to get the claw on your way to Fort Mason, you may want to think that actually now this is the time to turn around. 
There's always another, another time. So remembering that your judgment declines the colder you get. When you start to get cold and you start to feel that first cold symptom, maybe for you it's something else, it's something in your foot. A cramp can be an indication of that you're getting cold. Um, and the cramp is only gonna go away if you stretch it out or if you just stick with it. If you can continue to swim without panicking, then you can turn around and come back. And there's not really anything you can do for a cramp while it's happening. Cramps are very interesting signs. Nobody really knows why they happen and what prevents them and that kind of thing. Well hydrated um, and then in shape is, is really the best thing that you can do for that. But be aware as you start to get feel colder, in the, and this is also true in the summertime, because then it's a matter of time, right? It's time and temperature. So the higher the temperature, the longer the time, but the result is the same in the long, long run. So feel how you feel, look at your watch, because you're wearing your watch, and then decide, I have another five minutes, I have, you know, I have 10 minutes, I can get back. You don't want to get in that situation where you start to panic because you're really feeling cold and ineffective in the water. As your extremities, as you lose awareness of your extremities, your, the, the quality of your swimming is going to decline. And flailing faster isn't actually going to make you swim faster. You want to get out before you're not able to swim that well. Uh, look where you're going. Um, we talked about that already. The other thing you want to bear in mind with that is that if you do run into something and cut yourself, you need to get out of the water and scrub whatever it is that you just opened up because there's little creatures on everything and they get into your cuts. We could tell gross infection stories for the rest of the morning, which would make <laughs> Vanessa crazy, I know, but the moral of that is if you run into a buoy or you run into a boat, you run into the pier, um, we got to add about not swimming under the pier. Um, if you run into something, then you want to get out and scrub it off as soon as possible. Don't say, I'll take care of it when I get back to the, to the uh, dock. Um, yeah, be aware that you should just turn around. I don't like it. I've come down here, um, not to be too anecdotal, but I've come down here and I put my toe in and my whole body goes, ugh, and I go home. Wow. Yeah. And maybe I'm sick the next day because maybe it's the beginning of the thing. I mean, it hasn't happened in I a like long that. time. But if you're not yeah. feeling it, yeah. your body knows more than your, because you're like, oh, my friends are all here. Oh, I got to train for this thing. Oh, I'm not going to be able to swim tomorrow. Your brain has all kinds Good. of stories, as you know, because it's just life, for why you should do something that is not in your best interest at the moment, <laughs> right? So just... Go with that. I get to the opening and I'm like, I'm not feeling it. I just turn around and come back. Everybody else can go off. Oh, we need to finish. We have 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, specifically cold water swimming. And this is something that I learned when I first started to swim through winter times. Um, one thing is 54 degrees when the temperature's dropping is a lot colder than 54 degrees when the temperature's going up. You're acclimated when it's going up. 54 is balmy when it happens in April and May. It's freezing when it happens in November, as some of you probably have witnessed. Like, you know, 50, today was a half a degree colder. It felt very cold today, but it's not cold. This is, the, this is the warmest January I think I've ever experienced. So it's very, very warm, but it doesn't matter. Colder is worse than it being cold. You can get used to it being cold. You cannot get, it used, you cannot get used to it being colder. You're just, there's no way. The other thing that I learned in the winter times, the, the currents are different. The currents in the winter time, because of runoff, because of stronger ebbs, the ebbs will last longer. Sometimes they'll last one to two hours after a, after a low tide you know, when it should be flooding. They will also start quicker, too, because there's just more volume of water that's coming down from the mountains. Consa and it affects the cove. Even in, within the cove, there's some nuances of current that are really strong. The, the most dangerous place to be on an ebb in the winter is out in here. You know, because that ebb will come across the shore and push out this way. And it'll also be coming in this way and across through the where Fisherman's Wharf is. So consequently, it's hard to get this way, it's hard to get back that way, and it's hard to get back to shore. So remember that. You don't want to end your swim 
after 40 minutes or 30 minutes or at the end of any swim and find yourself here when you realize that's going to take me X amount of time longer than what it usually takes because there's no there's kind of no way out there's a little spot I hear that you can crawl out that's right here but as you know along Muni Pier there's nowhere to get out whatsoever Oh, the extreme okay. ebbs, okay. yes. Yeah. Um, two years ago, Sue and I were swimming, and we were doing a swim which, you know, was, is called an inside-outside along this pier, which, in the breakwater, which is, um, you know, like swimming through a, by a parking garage, and we came through the other way, we came in this way, on an ebb, so we're getting a good push coming back with the ebb into the cove, but it was so strong coming out this way there was a, the ebb was going out that way as well and you couldn't get back into the opening and so it was an ebb in both directions it was an exaggerated situation where you're stuck in the corner out by the big repair but we were stuck coming back into the opening and there probably were some nuances you could have gone oh, you know across the other side of the wedding cake and maybe snuck back in but we thought it was safer it being the beginning of our swim to swim back to the creekers back to the other end into the ebb and we felt a we felt a current pushing us towards the creekers but we realized eventually when that ebb kicked in near the creekers that we were going to be okay we had to just fight it and get around the corner and come back on the inside and so this is from people who you know a couple people who know should know what they're doing but the water the ocean and the currents are always going to know more than yours could be a lot more powerful than what you can do so be careful with those situations because that that added and we were we'd gone around once i think but that added 15 minutes to our swim so if we had only had five minutes left or if one of us only had had five minutes left then that could have been a, a situation right and so go ahead yeah, um, I, well the a, a flood swim, though, is always more forgiving in the cove. If you, you know, the, the club sits at the side of the cove where a flood's always going to push you back. So you can always swim into the flood and turn around and come back. And ebb, you always, it takes um, longer to get in from the opening. It takes longer to get in from the flag. It takes longer to get in from anywhere along Muni Pier. Whereas on a, on a flood, you're definitely going to get pushed back to the club. So you know you you feel old going out in a flood and you feel young coming back on an on an ebb, ebb swim it's the opposite you know an ebb swim you need to swim over in here if you want to ride something back if you want to make it easy at the end of your swim the other thing to think about in extreme ebbs is all of the stuff that's in the water kitchen sinks pieces of docks refrigerators all kinds of things so you just need you need to be aware of that again if you're wearing black goggles and not looking where you're going in the dark you might run into something. So um, I think, uh, yeah. um, One more thing about, about those ebbs and strong floods, because people do get fixated, people do get fixated upon um, swimming to Fort Mason in a flood, and they are not strong enough to swim through that flood on the outside of Muni Pier, and so consequently, they will go through Farnsworth Gap here. Um, Farnsworth Gap was invented for something that happened to a member named George Farnsworth who was swimming from Alcatraz. And it's invented for and is there for the opposite purpose. It's invented for somebody who, on an Alcatraz swim, the ebb kicked in so strongly that people found themselves in this pool of water here. They couldn't get around here, and so he went into the cove this way. And then it was the ebb is mitigated, and so he wound up being able to swim back to the club. But to go out this way... It's not what it was made for. It's an escape valve to get home, to get back here. It's not necessarily to go out just for the hell of it. Um, and being underneath anything, you don't want it. The best thing to touch out there is another human. And that can be dicey, as you all know. So everything else is worse. You know, everything else, you know, whether it's barnacles or whether it's a pier or whether it's a, you know, Muni Pier's falling down. So being swimming close to it is dicey. You know, in that five coves of death, you know, swimming underneath that thing is just dangerous and swimming close to it. There are fishing lines there. You know, if you are swimming a cove, swim, you can always do extra little loops in different places. So be very careful swimming close to anything that you don't want to touch because there's only so much hydrogen peroxide in the world that you can spray on these things. So, so, so we've talked about 
all these things that you should think about. So you, you came up, you had a plan, you had an idea of what you wanted to do, and now for some reason that's not what you're going to do, either because you decided or life happened to you once you got in and you need to make another decision. So we're going to talk a little bit, just a little bit about some plan B kind of things, and Susie, you might have some more information. So as an example, just to talk about Farnsworth Gap, Fort Mason, swimming against the flood. So if you go through, if you go through the gap and swim to Fort Mason, that's the same distance as going from the goalpost to the Appleton Hall. So rather than risking getting smashed into one of the pilings for the pier by a swell or scraping yourself on the rocks that are underneath or um, a pinniped encounter in closed quarters, that kind of thing, why don't you, this is one of my favorite things, is goalposts to the Appleton Hall. If you want to do, we, there, there's the Chaslap route here. So this is two miles. The club to either Gas House or the Creekers first, and then to the other one and back into the club, that is precisely two miles. You know what else is two miles? Two miles is the club around the cove to the Creekers and back is a little bit more than two, and you're not outside in boat traffic in the wind and the chop. Another thing that's two miles is the club to the Thayer buoys, swim around both Thayer buoys, Go to the goalposts, swim around, because if you don't like the flag, you know, it's really low tide, ugh, the flag, right? So the uh, uh, fair buoys, Appleton Hall, goalposts around the pier, around the buoy, and back the way you came just to the fair is one, is one mile. I'm sorry? The fair buoys are those two ball buoys, right, that are holding the fair away from the pier, yeah. And that green boat is the Appleton Hall, that green and black boat, OK? So that club to the Thayer buoys, the Appleton Hall, the goalposts, and around to the opening and back is a mile. So you don't want to do a Chaslap, or Chaslap isn't for you today because of the conditions, then do that twice. And the result is the same. Um, and it actually is, there's a significant difference um, the current impact when you're going straight across here can be significant. So if you want to work out against the current, there it is, and it's right inside the cove. Other inside the cove options, um, when I was training for Catalina, and I would come down um, twice a week in the afternoon because I hate swimming in the afternoon and doing things that you hate as part of a training for a big open water swim. <laughs> so, so I would get in the beach, and I'd go to the flag, and then back to the Thayer, and then to the first boat, and back to the Thayer, and then to the second boat, and back to the Thayer. You can do that for days, <laughs> right? And, but, and it's plenty of distance. And there's no shame in it, no harm in it. It gives you wind conditions, chop conditions, current conditions. And particularly if you're alone or it's the afternoon, that might be something that you want to think about. So. Um, so the first plan B is just another, just substituting a different plan A, right? And that is the best kind of outcome. I wanted to do something, but it's not a good idea, so I'm going to do something else. So there's some choices on something else. The other things that are plan B-ish is if you end up somewhere and you can't get back to the club, which you really don't want to end up in that situation. But if that were to happen, one of the things that you can do if you're at the Creekers, I do know years ago somebody who didn't know was standing on the beach with other people, dated it inside outside or something, and then he was, he was nowhere near their ability and he was unable to get back. You can go in here very carefully and you don't want to do it, but there are ladders along the beach, along the, the fishing areas, and you can climb out that way, okay? So you're right. Total bleh, right? But you're less likely to end up on the news that way, right? <laughs> also, just coming in here, if you're in here close to the Hyde Street Pier on either side, the current is significantly reduced by the presence of the boats, and you might be able to sneak in that way, OK? But again, if you're far, far away, and you're at the end of your strength, endurance, hydration, hypothermic rope, then that is that is problematic. It, it's not, there's no need to see how far you can push the envelope 
ever. Um, other places to get out, there is, there is, it is possible you can get in a gas house and get up to the dock, and then also it is possible to get up, to climb up these um, rocks and get to that walkway. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's some. Yeah, it's gross, but yeah. yeah. Um, in, in looking at this, the cove is large. The cove is bigger than the cove is bigger than any pool you'll ever find. In fact, the area between here and the Appleton Hall is bigger than any swimming pool you'll ever see. So there's no shame in swimming loops around in here, especially at the end of any kind of wintertime swim. If you think, okay, I want to get back in 30 minutes, at 20 minutes, be back here and do your last 10 minutes between the Thayer and the Appleton Hall and in that little pool of water. Watch out for rowboats that might be coming in and shells. But be careful. Um, you know, that's a big pool of water to swim in. You can get four and five and six minutes in very in, in, in a big one, two, one or two loops. Um, in, in looking at this swim, in, in the olden days, the Jeremiah O'Brien used to be birthed right here. And we would do, that's as far as we would go, and we called it an RTJOB. Round trip, Jeremiah O'Brien. And the, the route we went was here, around to about here, straight over to the middle of it, and you'd touch the ship, and you'd come back the same way. And we did that because we knew there were boats in the bay. This is called Gas House Cove. Gas. <laughs> Propellers. In fact, there's a little picture right here of a propeller. And that's what's coming in here and they are boats that are in a hurry. Sometimes they're drunk, and they're cruising right through here to get gas. So if you are doing this swim ever, and don't get lured out by some people who swim out too far, but this is fine swimming around here, right in through this pool of water. As, um, as was it Vanessa or Jeannie said, this is a beautiful place to swim right in here. It's the only natural shoreline or coastline in San Francisco from the Golden Gate Bridge all the way around. And it's this rock wall that goes into there. Be careful that in, if you have to come back through here, but this area here is where there can be boats. So be very, very careful. When you're swimming here, you should never be able to see the front of Fort Mason. If you can see this face of the first Fort Mason Pier, you're too far out. Come around, because it's curved, so you're always looking, you know, asymptote, right? So you're always looking at the edge of the curve, and it's deceptive. Because I, I don't know how many people I've seen, and they're like here, and I say, you're too far out. And they say, oh, but I can just see along the edge of the pier. Well, you can always see along the edge of the pier because it's a circle. So that's, so instead, look at something square, the end of Fort Mason. If you can see the front of Fort Mason, then you need to go closer to shore because you're out where the rowboats are going to be who are not who are facing the other way, as we talked about. So come in, come in closer. That's really important. This is a big traffic area. So I think we're out of time. And you, okay. had, the, yeah, you, had, the best, you had the best last sentence. Oh, um, it's, it's, the, it's words from the great Bob Roper. Oh, there's a, a one picture at, for you, those of you who've never been in the men's locker room. This is the men's locker room, and as you'll notice, how strangely your, your digits can warm up after swimming. Yeah. Um, the, the last word is the, in the words of uh, Bob Roper, your best swim is your next swim. So always keep that in mind when you're out there, that there's another swim to happen, and plan that way. Mm -hmm.